in about 1972, I met up with Bob Monroe, and Bob Monroe is the fellow who wrote Journeys Out of the Body, an ultimate journey. He had a farm called Whistlefield Farm, and on that farm he built a laboratory for the study of consciousness. It was like, build it and they will come. He built it, and myself and another friend of mine who was an electrical engineer, we ran into Bob, and Bob was looking for some scientists to study consciousness, and we volunteered with the idea that he would teach us what he knew about out-of-body and, and that sort of thing, and we would be his free scientists that would make sure we had good protocols and did research. So my interaction with Bob from that time on, which is around 1972, for the next six years was about 20 hours a week. We'd go out every evening after work, and from 6.30 or 7 in the evening all the way to like 2 o'clock in the morning, we'd spend with Bob in the lab, and then we'd come out on weekends. A lot of time with Bob, and he did teach myself, and Dennis Menerick was the double E that went with me. He taught us about how to body and how to go and how to get there whenever we wanted to and get there easily. So we started doing research about how did it work. Now, I'm a physicist, so what I do is model reality. That's what physics is all about. So my mission was to find out what is it, what are the limitations. And we did mostly uh, evidential things at first because both Dennis and I were like, convince us, you know, we, we're not going to believe it until it's our own experience. So he had to have us do a lot of evidential things, remote viewing, healing, going places, What's the number I just wrote on the blackboard while we're in another room in a booth? And Dennis and I went on a couple of -of out-of-body adventures together where he had us where we couldn't hear each other, electromagnetically and acoustically isolated booths. He was talking to both of us independently, and there we were having conversations with each other, answering each other's questions on the tapes. So we just did a lot of stuff. So that's where my background in consciousness studies comes from. It's really mathematics. It's computer code that's computing our reality. So we've got all kinds of experiments that show the same thing that Gates did. You look into reality close enough, and what you find is that it's not material. It's information-based. Information-based means it's computed. Computed means first computer code, and the first computer code, you're going to find error correction. How does Jim Gates' error-correcting codes embedded within the equations of supersymmetry that describe fundamental particles, from a physicist's point of view, how unusual is it to find these error-correcting codes in the equations of supersymmetry, and what does that mean to you? Yeah, well, you see, what he's done is he's taken string theory... And in order to model our reality, they have to use equations to do that. And then in those equations, lo and behold, there looks like there's computer code. An information system wants to evolve by lowering its entropy, and it does that by organization. The key to this is that the projector of the virtual reality has to be in another dimension. Good at Harvard is talking about there being an infinite number of universes. Others think that universes might even be somehow embedded within each other in some way. If the projector of the virtual reality is in another dimension, and the projection then involves holographic projection. That would explain why there is this merger of two concepts, the holographic universe and the simulated computer universe, because what's being projected is holographic from the macro down to the micro. The holographic universe is a nice metaphor, but there's no need for holography to to get involved in it at all. The simulated universe doesn't need holography to make any connections. It simply computes a data stream. The data stream is sent to a player. The player interprets that data stream as the virtual reality. Everything takes place in consciousness. Consciousness is the computer. Consciousness is the player. That's what's going on. The whole game is played in consciousness. The Matrix movie didn't need any holography either. That's just an additional complication that's unnecessary to get to the answer. Although it is a popular metaphor partly because in a hologram, 
every piece of it has the information of the whole. But that's also true in fractals. Every piece has all the information of the whole. And this system of information, a fractal pattern is a pattern of information. That's why a computer can compute fractals, because it's just information. And the fractal has that same attribute of all the information, part of the whole. So you end up with a process fractal that creates everything. And there are also places, like the places you get to in out-of-body, that have very loose rule sets as opposed to physical universes, which tend to have more complicated rule sets, more detailed, tighter rule sets. So it's all just virtual realities. When your avatar dies, the consciousness doesn't die. You know, just like when your elf dies, the player doesn't die. So the consciousness doesn't die. The consciousness goes on. It gets back in the game again. When it does that, that consciousness ends up in a different virtual reality than this virtual reality. That's a transition virtual reality. Dreaming is another virtual reality that we experience. The dream reality isn't any less real than this physical reality. It's just different. It's a different virtual reality, a different rule set, different data stream. And one of the neat things about it is that once you understand how consciousness works, then you can turn around and derive quantum mechanics and relativity from the ground up. And the amazing thing is that when you do that, Quantum mechanics and relativity now get along with each other rather than being opposed to each other. And quantum mechanics is no longer a weird science. It's just a logical science. You can look at a quantum mechanical problem and just look at the logic of it and say what the answer is. You don't need to do a lot of math. It's a perfectly understandable thing. And I do lectures and I talk about the science, I talk about the physics, but then I usually spend as much time talking about what does it matter to the individual? You know, why should you care? people sitting in the audience. Why is this important to you? And it's very important. Everything about their life, their choices, their relationships, it matters to all of that. So it's not just physics. It's much bigger than that. And the neat thing I found is once you understand consciousness, you can derive physics. You see, the causality runs the other way. It doesn't run from the physical world to the brain, and then the brain somehow creates consciousness. That's wrong. It doesn't run that way. Causality runs from consciousness to a virtual reality, to the rule set, which orders this virtual reality. So once you understand consciousness, you can take that same understanding and come up with a logical quantum mechanics that isn't weird science. What will the consequences be if you, with your colleagues in this new paper on testing the simulation hypothesis, end up with a confirmation that we are in a computer simulated universe. What are the consequences for physics, space travel, us, any practical consequences? Yes, there's some huge consequences. I mean, there's always consequences to science, but that's not the major consequence. Science will change from the ground up. It will have to get rid of its beliefs in a material reality and will have to see this in terms of information. And that will make a huge difference. But that step brings into a question, well, if this is a simulation, who's in charge? Right. Who's the programmer? Where is it simulated from? So suddenly questions about this being not the reality, but a, a subset of something bigger. And what is this bigger thing? You see, it brings up all of those metaphysical questions suddenly have scientific rigor because scientific rigor says this is a virtual reality, then it cannot be computed from inside this virtual reality. It has to be computed from other, elsewhere, from another reality frame. And so consciousness must be in another reality frame. So the second step is that they realize that consciousness is the computer. If you take those two steps... Once you realize that consciousness is a computer, it's just a logical inference to come out with love is the answer. That's why we're here. This is a virtual reality, okay? It's a trainer, just like a flight trainer. This is an entropy reduction trainer. And suddenly, if love is the answer, cooperation, caring about other is the way you evolve, and this self-centered fear thing, fear is the way you de-evolve, that will make a huge difference in not just for the scientists, but for everybody walking around on the planet. And then you realize that 
because this is a trainer, you know how trainers are. If you get it right and you do the right thing in a trainer, you get rewards. You know, if you don't crash your airplane in a flight trainer, you uh, get to continue to fly it. So people will realize that as they work in the direction that they're meant to work in, what our goal is, what our challenge is, and our mission is, everything starts to work good. Instead of a constant struggle, you find that life is good. You find happiness. You find satisfaction. All of the good stuff starts to fall at your feet once you start cooperating with the system and growing up and getting rid of the fear and becoming love. So it has the potential to change everything at a very fundamental level.